about time. It's about time that, uh, you know, we're being uh, looked at, and that we are a people of this country. Standing Bear is widely regarded as the Martin Luther King of Native America, as its first civil rights champion. There's so many people that don't know the story of Chief Standing Bear. He was the one who actually gave the ability for Native Americans to be in a completely different status. The United States government and, and people in general knew nothing about Indians other than warfare. They weren't used to Indians being in a courtroom. Statuary Hall is an important place in the capital and in the history of America. Statuary Hall used to be the chamber where the House of Representatives conducted its business. Justin Morrill, who was a representative at the time, a congressman, he's the one who really was able to propose the legislation for the creation of the National Statuary Hall, and that finally happened in 1864. The real point of having a National Statuary Hall isn't just to celebrate individuals that we all know and already celebrate. It's to pick those unsung heroes from your state that really are deserving of a national stage but haven't maybe had their story told around the country. Statues in the capital of the United States are there largely at the wish of the state legislatures. Each state gets two statues. The only rules that the federal government enacted as part of this legislation is that the person needed to be notable. They had to be deceased. The rest was really a sort of a state decision. Of course, all bills start as an idea. And uh, the original idea was that we would like to have uh, written a bill to have Standing Bear exchanged for one of the two statues there. 807 was the original bill that was uh, going to replace uh, J. Sterling Morton with Willa Cather. William Jennings Bryan was the first statue along with Julius Sterling Morton that Nebraska chose to place in the Statuary Hall collection. William Jennings Bryan had ran for president, I believe, three times, never won, and had also been the editor for the Omaha World Herald and the Secretary of State. So it's not to take away from his contributions to Nebraska or to this country. The reason why these replacement opportunities for states came about through federal legislation was that so states could honor more than just one or two people. Anyone who would ever come to the Capitol would see that it was dominated by white males, which is okay for what the purpose of, the, of what they contributed, but that shouldn't be to the exclusion of women and people of color who've been so much a part of our country. Throughout the history with our relationship to the federal government that so we've always been looked at on the border of a citizen, but also mainly looked at as an alien. Many of our, our people, they fought and gave their lives for us to be here, to be recognized, to, to be able to live today. Our homeland was in Niobrara, Nebraska. I've got you know, grandmother, great-grandmothers that are buried in that cemetery. And it's just a place where you can really connect and feel like you're at home there. Well, you know, just kind of like when you come in your own home, you know, where you kind of just ah, relax. You're at home. You can hear the tall grasses kind of shuffle as the wind passes through them. So this land's everything for us. I mean, it's where all of our ancestors are buried for centuries. You know, the bones of our relatives, our ancestors go back into the earth. All the grass, the animals, the vegetation, all those things that grow after our people were buried. Our DNA is in all those things. You can't take us from the land because that's part of us. To be taken away from our ancestors was something that's hard to imagine and unfathomable. 
and it really you know came about through an an error i would say the united states government through the treaty of fort laramie in, in 1868 really accidentally provided our land to the lakota nation the government didn't want to correct that mistake so unfortunately they decided to force us from our homelands move us to oklahoma Standing Bear and some other Ponca tribal chiefs said, no, this is not where we want to be. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter what you think. You're going anyways. They got a, um, issued a, the army to escort us. And that was the Ponca Trail of Tears of 1875. We walked over 500 miles down to Oklahoma and many of our tribal members passed away along the journey and when they got down there, nothing for our people to live on. A lot of people started dying down there because it's a whole different environment. They moved us to Oklahoma and wanted us to do all the things that we were already doing up there but didn't supply. From summer of 1877 to summer of 1878, one third of the Ponca tribe died of malaria. Chief Standing Bear had no idea uh, what to do. There was nothing to prevent his people from dying. Christmas week of 1878, his only son, a 14-year-old boy named Bear Shield, lay dying on the bottom of a dank army canvas tent, curled up in a fetal position, slowly dying of malaria. And before his eyes closed in death, he begged his father, he begged Chief Standing Bear, take me home so I can be with, be with our people and the lands that were dreamed to us. So we said, okay. I mean, if you imagine that sitting there, your child saying that to you, you, know, you, you have an obligation to honor your child, right? So that's what he was doing. So they didn't get permission to, to kind of, they said, we're going. Chief Standing Bear then in his late 50s, he wrapped the body of his only son, Bear Shield, in his best clothes, and then wrapped his body in a buffalo robe and gently put it into the back of a rickety buckboard wagon. And about one o'clock that afternoon, he and 29 others were going to fulfill a promise that the chief had made to his son. And at that moment in history, January 2nd, 1879, the government of the United States had entered into 374 treaties with the native people of America. And on January 2nd, 1879, by then they had broken all 374 treaties. But Standing Bear was not going to break the promise that he had made his son. You know, you lost people coming down, being removed from Nebraska to Oklahoma, and you knew that you're probably gonna lose somebody going home. For them to risk that, and you know, we're here because of that. He knew he ran the risk of possibly getting caught by the federal government, uh, and that happened when he got into Omaha. I think it was more shocking for our Omaha relatives to see the condition that they were in, some barefoot, bleeding, starving and word got out to Fort Omaha, not far away, that a group of renegade uh, Ponca men, women, and children had abandoned the reservation without permission, and they needed to be rounded up, and they were. Brigadier General George Crook, who had spent the last 15, 20 years fighting Native American tribes, stood on the steps of the general's quarters at Fort Omaha on that late March morning in 1879, and he watched these 30 men, women, and Ponca children, and it really struck him hard what he saw. I felt sympathy, but he was, I still got to follow through with my words. There was this guy named Thomas Tibbles mm. who had been known to be like friendly to the Indian. He was a uh, journalist, and he caught wind of it. Tibbles shed light on that situation, and I, you know, without General Crooks and Tibbles, you know, it never would have happened. You know, if it was any other general, you know, any other people, our story may not have been told. May of 1879, we have a middle-aged American Indian chief walking into a court of law, suing the powerful government of the United States on the belief that they had no legal right to keep him in prison, that they had no legal right 
to keep him from burying his son. The argument against him was Indian isn't considered a citizen or, or a person under United States law. The renegade, the hostile, that sort of thing. And they filed a writ of habeas corpus, which is a fancy legal word, which essentially means the government has to prove that they have a legal right to detain, in this case, Standing Bear. The substance of this trial was, is this even allowable? Does the Standing Bear or Indians even have standing to be in a courtroom to file a lawsuit? General Crooks, young, brash, inexperienced lawyer, argued that this should never have gone to trial because you had to be a citizen in order to file a writ of habeas corpus claim. General Crook's attorney. But Standing Bear's attorney pointed out that that wasn't the case. You had to be a citizen or a person. So the only question now before the judge was whether or not Standing Bear was a person. So the case goes from May 1st, all of May 2nd, everybody has had their say. At the last minute, as evening falls, on May 2nd, 1879, this jam courthouse looks on in astonishment as they see this middle-aged Native American chief get up from the plaintiff's table, walk to the judge's bench, look up, extend his right hand, holding it there for a long time. Says that hand is not the color of yours. If I prick it, the blood will fall and I shall feel pain. The blood is the same color as yours. God made me. I am man. I never committed any crime. If I had, I would not stand here to make a defense. I would suffer the punishment and make no complaint. I seem to be standing on a high bank of a great river with my wife and little girl at my side. I cannot cross that river, and impassable cliffs arise behind me. I hear the noise of great waters. I look and see a flood coming. The waters rise to our feet and then to our knees. My little girl stretches her hands towards me and says, save me. I stand where no member of my race ever stood before. There's no tradition to guide me. The chiefs who preceded me knew nothing of the circumstances that surround me. I hear only my little girl say, save me. In despair, I look toward the cliffs behind me and I see a dim trail that may lead to a way of life. No Indian ever passed over that trail. It looks to be impossible. I make the attempt. I take my child by the hand. My wife follows after me. Our hands, our feet are torn by the sharp rocks, and our trail is marked by our blood. At last I see a rift in the rocks. A little way beyond, there are green prairies. The swift running water, the Niobrara, pours between the green hills. There are the graves of my fathers. There again, we will pitch our teepee and build our fires. I see the light of the world and of liberty just ahead. But in the center of the path, there stands a man. Behind him, I see soldiers in number like the leaves of the trees. If that man gives me the permission, I may pass onto life and liberty. If he refuses, I must go back and sink beneath the flood. You are that man. And as the trial and Standing Bear's words echoed, women could be heard weeping in the back. Before long, General Crook got up from his defense table and went over and shook Standing Bear's hand. Then there was applause. It's indigenous people are, are the embodiment of these words, right? Because it stood for Indian people. That's why it's so important, because it stood for Indian people. We're relatives. Why can't you see what I'm trying to do is something in, in honor, right? You know, for my son. Wouldn't you do the same? Even though the judge made this monumental, incredible civil rights case where he said, Indians are human beings within the meaning of the law, 
we had nowhere to go to. They had taken our homelands away in Nebraska. And so that wasn't the end of the story. Standing Bear still had to go make further efforts and plead for the government to give us back some land so that he could stay up in Nebraska where our traditional homelands were. And finally, the government returned some land to the Ponca and we were able to return to Niobrara and he was able to grant his son his dying wish. One of the things we did was we walked through the trial and the decision of Judge Dundee on the floor of the legislature. We actually read portions of it. That this hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, it will have pain. It was right after we read that that then we took a vote. Those in favor vote aye, those opposed vote nay. And once we shared the story of Standing Bear with the legislature, it was an easy sell. Uh, there was no opposition whatsoever. Just walk through, watch your step here. Well, the journey began uh, when I met Judy Gashkabas, and uh, she told me the story as she tells it to anybody who will listen. I probably said, you know, we ought to think about doing a statue. And they just asked, would I be interested in taking a commission to create a sculpture of Chief Standing Bear? This is the Quay original of Standing Bear. He's all beat up from the mold making. You can see all of the seams where each mold was made. We have to do it in sections on a full size sculpture like this. They try to study, get into the idea and the concept behind what I'm representing so that when you see the final piece, it has that spirit behind it of representation of a greater concept. Nowhere is that more true than the Standing Bear sculpture, of course. And I, I began to create and design from that point. It has to start with the statue that was put in uh, Lincoln, because that's where the statue was, uh, was developed for. So they contacted me about creating this sculpture for Lincoln, Nebraska, right near their state capital. And they created a space to the indigenous peoples of Nebraska. There's a feature wall in this plaza, and then there's the centerpiece of the sculpture of Chief Standing Bear. During the process of creating the sculpture for Lincoln, um, I met Larry Wright, the chairman of the Ponca tribe. So as we're here today to honor our Nudahonga, Atunaze, Chief Standing Bear. And Larry said, well, would you be able to create one for the tribal lands? The second statue on the uh, Ponca lands up in Niobrara and the third in the, in the United States uh, Statuary Hall. And so that's kind of how this organically became three statues where it started only as one. When the clay is all finished and detailed, we make molds of the entire piece, and they took the molds from there and poured the waxes and then did each step. So in the lost wax process, the waxes are poured, and then they're sprued and dipped in ceramic shell and that shell coats the waxes inside and out, and then it's passed through a high temperature oven where the wax is melted out. And that negative space in the ceramic shell is where the molten bronze is poured. And when it's poured and it's cooled, the ceramic shells are cracked off of the bronze, and those raw bronze castings are cleaned up, welded together, and then the welds have to all be chased off so that you can't see where any of the welds were. And once that was all finished, we bead blasted the sculpture and then did the patina. Patina is a chemical coloration that's applied to the metal. And so the metal's heated and then different chemicals are applied with water. And then as those chemicals bond to the surface of the metal, it actually oxidizes it to different colorations. And getting the bronze finished and then creating up the bronze was also a process, you know, getting it all the way to DC. It's like hard to describe the feeling of the sculpture arriving and meeting me there in front of the Capitol. The level of excitement, it's like being in a championship game right before the game. You can't wait to get out there on the floor. Times that by about a thousand. Part of my role is guiding the design process. And then the other part of my role is being here when the statues arrive, which generally happens in the dead of night. <laughs> so 
little different than going to a gallery and hanging paintings on a wall. They had to have an enormous crane that lifted the box up and passed it through the front doors there of the Capitol. You're just hoping, I mean, praying, hoping everything will go well. You're so powerless in that situation, you know, it feels like they're handling your baby. It takes several, several hours to position a sculpture. And then, of course, the other sculpture that was here prior was also was removed. We had to get William Jennings Bryan out, who was going back to Nebraska. They brought him out first, and then they moved uh, Mr. Russell over to where Brian was, and then they moved Mr. Burke over to where Mr. Russell had been, and then that opened up the space for Chief Standing Bear to go where Mr. Burke had been. He came in laying backwards with his arm up like this, and they had to tip the box all the way up. We actually got to stand back and just look, and they're cleaning up their stuff. In that moment, it just took my breath away. And he started coming out, and he had his hand out. I felt like he was looking at me. And that was the moment for me where I felt like he is here in the United States Capitol and that so many people will get to witness that and see him. My children, my sons, will be able to see a Ponca person in the United States Capitol and that we are still here. I just think about those times when our grandfathers and grandmothers came here, you know, to, to, to meet and to speak and to negotiate peace, to still carry on that, you know, that dream and that, that vision of what they wanted, you know. It's emotional, you know, being here. And... Have you seen the finished product? No, I haven't. The statue? Uh-uh. Every morning I braid my hair, right? What I was taught by braiding my hair is remembering. Remembering who you are. The braid itself represents love, represents mind, body, spirit. And then the, the values, strength, humility, and compassion. So when I braid, I, I remember. I remember standing there. I remember the history of the people. I remember, uh, I remember teachings. I remember stories. You guys got a heater around here? It's on now? <laughs> I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. It's good that uh, the United States is, is honoring you know, one of ours. I just ask that people uh, kind of live how, what he talked about, you know. And I think about a lot of Indian leaders, you know. That's what kind of sits with me right now. <laughs> so I, that's why I said I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Please rise for the presentation of the colors of the United States and the Ponca tribe, the singing of our national anthem, and the retiring of the colors. If we're going to improve the future, we must acknowledge the past. Chief Standing Bear faced injustices beyond imagination. The injustice of being forced from his ancestral homeland, the injustice of losing hundreds of members of his tribal family, including his son, Bear Shield, to starvation and suffering because the U.S. government's broken treaty promises. It is almost unthinkable to us today that it wasn't until 1879, after Standing Bear's trial, that Native Americans 
were declared to be persons for consideration of the law. The House of Representatives met in this room that we are now in until 1857, and their deliberations were watched over by another statue, Cleo, the muse of history. She served as a constant reminder that their words and actions, the good and the bad, would be judged by time. Cleo was here watching, recording, when in 1830, Congress shamefully passed the Indian Removal Act in this very room. amazing journey that Standing Bear had been on, a journey that began in May of 1877 that included 550 miles of being forcibly marched across Nebraska, across campus, into Oklahoma, to think of the march back on January 2nd, 1879, and still the journey is not complete. And then it goes to a courtroom, and then he gets a verdict, and the journey continues to the sacred white bluffs overlooking the Niobrara. And you would think, okay, well, that's a really powerful end to the Standing Bear story, but it doesn't end there. And so after all of this walking, and after all of this heartbreak, and after all of this effort and fight, to bury his son. And in the, in the course of burying his son, he becomes a civil rights icon for his people and he creates new law. The journey finally ends in September of 2019 when he walks into Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C.